All right, we're live on, on YouTube right now. So let me take a couple of minutes to introduce today's uh, session and then we'll, we'll open up to the panel. Hello, welcome. Welcome to today's uh, B plus session. B plus means be positive. Be positive is the A plus way to be B plus. Being B plus is the... B plus is the A plus way to be because of the current situation where uh, we're dealing with a, a an environment that is fairly unknown for large community of experts around the world, where we are faced with something that we, we haven't seen before, yet there are things that we can do that we have seen before all our life. So today is actually world health day when i decided uh, yesterday that we will have a panel of doctors uh, and dr ismail dr raghunandan helped me to quickly pull a uh, a team of experts all around the world to be part of this discussion i did not know that today actually is world health day and it is such an opportunistic uh, uh, mechanism that everything came together on such a fantastic day to talk to some people that are actually the saviors of the humankind right now. And given the situation, like I was saying, which we are faced with, with a lot of unknowns at this point, the people that can deal with unknowns, the people that can deal with uncertainties, the people that can show courage under fire, the people that can put their lives in front of others. I'm not talking about soldiers. I'm not talking about people that actually take guns and do uh, wars for us. I'm talking about those that wear white coats, that wear blue coats, take a stethoscope or a syringe or wear gloves to their hands and show up every time somebody is faced with an uncertainty, somebody who is faced with a, a life question and somebody who can stay behind you all the time and then say, I'm here to save your life. They've been doing this all their life. They've been doing this forever for humanity. Now, more than ever, the world is taking a notice of that. The world is taking a notice of the amazing uh, set of human beings that's always been there for us. That's always been there uh, saving the humankind from various calamities, various threats that we ever faced before. Now we are faced with someone like something like that again, and there they are. There they are walking on this uh, mother earth right now, every part of the world, showing up with grace and courage. And with smile, I would say, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what they do all the time. With smile, even though they're, faced, they're, them, they're putting themselves in the line of fire. And I'm talking about the doctors, I'm talking about the healthcare workers, I'm talking about the nurses, I'm talking about every single person that's involved in that supply chain of health that is ensuring all the people that are faced with this uncertainty are getting uh, one, one thing, <clears throat> instructions to be safe. And secondly, those who got impacted or potentially would get impacted would get proper tests and attention and everything else. And we are, as humankind, blessed to have this kind of uh, genre of people among us. And I, I actually call them uh, walking gods on earth or angels on earth. That's exactly who they are. And Today, we're gonna to spend some time with them. Uh, we have an eclectic group of doctors that are, that are specialists in various fields that can bring in different perspectives that are actually from different parts of the country in US and that are <clears throat> from different parts of the world as well. I have you know, doctors from Kuwait, I have some doctors from India joining us. And depending on how the response is for this one, we can have you know, every Tuesday perhaps bring in different kinds of doctors from different places. Uh, hopefully uh, we can uh, we can bring in different perspectives and a lot of advice and and strength of optimism. The reason why I've been personally doing wanting to do this uh, using social media is is to provide a a mechanism for people to come express positivity, express positive energy, 
that is a, uh, that everybody is trying personally to instill in their own self so that that positive energy can resonate in other hearts and it can spread around the world just like uh, more powerfully than the virus itself that is the intention of this uh, mechanism that we are trying to do and i, I want to thank all the doctors who are extremely busy at this time of the uh, of the situation in the world to spend this very valuable time with us and uh, those who are all watching live on youtube uh, thank you for spending your time as well to interact with the doctors uh, please chime in with your questions as we as we interact with them and uh, we will conduct this session to to large extent in english i know every doctor that is uh, assembled here today uh, is uh, from telugu community that is the power of it in a, in a sense but they belong to all of it they, i mean they're universal from the spirit of what they have taken oath for and uh, that's how they serve anyway so we're going to conduct this uh, session all in english and we'll uh, hopefully uh, generate certain knowledge and uh, optimism and positivity towards the future and some get to get a sense of reality what's out what's going on out there with that i'm going to welcome the panel today doctors welcome you all to this uh, b plus session and i think there are no better human beings than to spread positivism right now in the world than you guys are <clears throat> and i thank you for your service and uh, I am the only one right now but I'm sure watching everybody that's watching is going to do this uh with us as well. I'm going to clap for you guys and uh hopefully everybody is watching is going to do that uh, and we will do the same clapping at the end of the session as well. Uh so given uh the introduction <clears throat> what I'm going to do is um I I see doctors from left to right so I'm going to use your names as I see you on the screen and I do a brief introduction I'll keep the introduction limited to your name and your specialization and where you're from. and then the general question for all of you to start with is uh we all know the about the pandemic uh, as common man we know certain things of it we see a lot of information but getting bombarded in various different uh channels that we uh, have access to we want to hear from you what you see as a reality on the ground and uh, how you are dealing with the situation that you are dealt with and uh, what kind of uh, ground reality that you are facing so with that's the open question i'm going to start with dr sampath kumar and uh, uh, sir you are from uh, from nellore india that's awesome and uh, which is you, sir, sir dr sampath kumar uh, you are a uh, you are a neurophysician from, yes. from nellore in india so welcome to the program uh, so thank you. and i know what we all know what india is going through right now what mechanisms the governments have been taking up uh, there as well so what are you seeing sir on the ground there and uh, what is your uh, uh, take on the situation so a very good morning to you all uh, uh, nice to be part of this program i think uh, lot of my classmates and friends are there across the globe and all the first one thing i want to say is first of all i want to congratulate the driver and brothers who took very initiative to start this program so first of all let me congratulate you both of you to make yes. up this program so first of all uh, so this is one this is i think uh, which unites across the globe uh, because the problem which unites as i was saying uh, all people across the globe uh, had uh, really feeling bad about the disease and the thing is that uh, it is not much to worry about this disease actually uh, which is common disease which we come in all infectious diseases like that especially viral infections which are very common in the public across the globe and especially uh, what i feel is the indians which we have like commonly exposed to a lot of these infections across the globe so we feel little bit of uh, more innate immunity for the indians and all across the globe and one more thing which i want to say is uh, precautions which you take will really prevent you to not expose to disease and all uh, that's one thing i can say uh, being a neurologist i think we are not a uh, first receiving end of this disease actually to say as this is how it manifests and all first of all the so most of the neurology complications are secondary to the various uh, systemic involvement what virus will portal of entry which leads to the systemic complications the neurology one part of it the brain which receives guns and all but still we have received a lot of reports concrete reports are not still there to say direct involvement of virus with brain and uh, nervous system and all so with this introduction i think uh, you can take the some of the questions from other areas also I will go to Dr. Shailaja Garu. Uh, Dr. Shailaja, uh, ma'am, you are from. Uh, let me see. Uh, Dr. Shailaja Garu is a pediatric neurologist and an autism expert in Dallas area. Uh, ma'am, welcome to the program. 
And same question to you. Thank you. I'm going after the adult neurologist. So I'm a pediatric <laughs> neurologist. I take care of uh, brain disorders as well, uh, mainly kids. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Baskar and uh, Dr. Ismail, who uh, invited me to this uh, panel. And uh, uh, I think uh, kids are less affected uh, compared to adults, but we need to be careful because they can be silent carriers and bring home the germs and can infect the older people and uh, grandparents and so on. So I'll, I'll talk more uh, later on, <laughs> maybe in Excellent. any questions, yeah. Very good. And we'll go to uh, Dr. Ismail, sir, you're, uh, you're right next to Dr. Sahil Jagaru on the, on the screen. So Dr. Ismail Sohail Kandagaru, he is uh, very well known in Dallas area, uh, especially because he's been very outspoken about this uh, crisis since the day one. And uh, he's a family uh, medicine expert. Uh, he, he works in Fort Worth for veteran services, I believe. Uh, Dr. Ismail Garisa, you go next. Sir. Andariki Namaskaram. Yeah, so um, I'm glad. Th thanks for everyone to make making time to join this. Um, so Madhat Nichi, I'm, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm, I just had a uh, CME meeting. I was supposed to go to Harvard, Boston. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I canceled the trip, thankfully, and then we did this on online. And uh, the infectious disease experts uh, uh, gave a talk on that, and uh, that caught my interest uh, in the beginning. That it was like at least a month ago. So uh, right now I'm caring for patients uh, uh, directly here um, uh, from my laptop, just like I'm how I'm talking to you. I'm talking to my patients from home. Um, working from home, like in a telemedicine basis. Uh, I have few patients who are positive, but uh, thankfully they are, uh, uh, they are, they have less symptoms, so they are staying home. Um, so we are kind of talking to them, giving some support, um, telling them, I'm just monitoring them on a daily, day-to-day -day basis. Um, uh, few of them, and most importantly uh, for our patients uh, who are sick with the symptoms and they think it is COVID, well, it's better to educate them um, on, on all the platforms, like staying home is very important. And most important is the if you go out for any grocery, six feet distance, maintaining that six feet distance, and then having, right now, the CDs recommend a mask. So we can't wear masks right now. So, but anyway, so that's the thing. So I want to thank everyone. Uh, most of us are my seniors from Colonel Medical College, and I see them after a long time. Um, and I'm glad all of them are here. So we'll take questions. I think uh, infectious disease doctor um, uh, is also here. So um, uh, who will give more insight of what's going on. And also I see Dr. Manoj, who is a uh, resident who is working and then the hospitalist who are uh, taking care of the patients on a day-to-day -day basis, not like me in the home, but in the hospital. Uh, so thank you all. So thank, thank you, Dr. Ismail, sir. Uh, let me go to... <laughs> Dr. Prabhakar uh, Venduri, sir. Sir, welcome, sir, Dr. Prabhakar Garu. Raghu, do you want to introduce um, Dr. Prabhakar? Dr. Yeah. Raghu? Yeah. Yeah, Prabhakar, sir, Nair, Prabhakar Garu is uh, working in Anantapu. He's a renowned, very well known. Uh, uh, psychiatrist. Oh, wow. So I felt I felt uh, his inputs will be very useful for the pressure and the trauma taken by the not only each one of us. We know what we are. Yes. We know we have seen we have seen worse than this in our lives as a doctors. But the families and the world going through is a new thing for them. It's not. A, it's not. It's not a any. Uh, normal thing for a normal disease or even <clears throat> bigger diseases which are dangerous, considered to be dangerous, cancers are dealt with the families by more easily than this a small infection as mentioned by Sampar. So that kind of pressure can be handled and uh, uh, can be advised by Dr. Prabhakar. That's why that's the basic idea of uh, joining him in the team. Thank you, Thank Raghunandan. You. Thank you, Raghunandan. Uh, and Bhaskar and others for making this activity. So nowadays, uh, every one of us are facing a lot of uh, stress, especially regarding uh, 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 pandemic, corona pandemic. So this time, uh, many people are uh, going to 
deal with the uh, uh, types of uh, uh, so types mechanisms prevent to measures just i want to highlight the how we need to reduce the stress about uh, uh, this uh, uh, pandemic uh, many people including uh, parents grand uh, grandparents children students doctors everyone of everyone among the globe is having some sort of anxiety and getting panic some people are going planning bus getting some suicidal thoughts unable to work and uh, getting uh, panic uh, attacks mm-hmm. not getting proper sleep so uh, again because of excessive stress there is uh, um, uh, more critical main activity which in turn leads to excessive release of cortisol which in turn re- decreases the uh, total immunity both physically and mentally which is more dangerous when compared to the effects of corona so that's why um uh, uh, at present time we need to be more uh, conscious about the consequences of uh, uh, corona virus and we need to stable at this time we need to improve our uh, psychological strength and we need to reduce the mental trauma by uh, um, having awareness about some uh, psychological tips so how to manage our children uh, the children in you know, most of the uh countries uh, like for example in india uh, 10th class exams are uh, are postponed people are more worrying about the uh, exams and uh, people some people students are more worrying about the neat exams which is not uh, which is also postponed uh, parents are worrying some people, uh, students are uh, staying in a hostel somewhere uh, um, uh, not uh, not coming back to their homes so parents are worrying they at this present time we need to spend lot of time with the parents uh, children parents and grand, grand children so some people are lo- losing their jobs so some uh, for example uh, in anandpur uh, nearly 40% of the 40 members of the government hospital staff went on quarantine so including doctors including staff nurses and some uh, uh, technicians uh, we are staying away from the children and the family with a lot of tension so after the exposed to the uh, positive corona case so in such situations many people are uh, calling me and taking advice getting panic not getting sleep uh, getting palpitations like this lot of stress which is more dangerous than a corona virus so at this time we need to uh, uh, concentrate on the stress management techniques and we need to improve our uh, psychological strength and which uh, can cause more uh, which can lead to uh, uh, chronic physical disorders like uh, hypertension diabetes and cardiac problems so uh, in uh, with all these uh, ideas I, w- i want to i am ready to uh, that's good sir that's a good that's a very good uh, opening with uh, perspective from a psychiatrist so we're going to go to uh, we'll come back again sir with little more questions i'm 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 also requesting people on uh, that are watching live on youtube please type your question uh, in the chat so i will relay the questions to the doctors panel and uh, they will answer it once we go through a uh, one round table we will take the question so next i'm going to go to dr uh, dr imam i'm trying to find uh, the specialization uh, dr imam sheikh is a frontline hospitalist in tyler texas sir welcome and uh, give me your perspective on this sir thank you uh, thank you bhaskar gaur and uh, dr ismail for inviting me i am um, i'm a hospitalist working in tyler texas it's a community hospital and uh, we are the <clears throat> thank you for us for all the people who admits with the covid or uh, suspected covid we have seen in the last couple of weeks the patient population is steadily increasing in the numbers and also we have seen some of the people with severe kind of uh, pneumonia which is negative for the covid but still it looks like a covid so mm. it's going to put a tremendous uh, pressure on the hospital system mm-hmm. I, i know that uh, we have seen worse than this one like uh, another kind of pneumonias with the staph infections and the flu the problem with the pandemic is it is not about the disease severity it is about how it spreads quickly from 
one community to the community and the nation to nation. When, when it happens at one time, all the hospitals will be flooded with the people and you're gonna be short of the supplies with the PPEs, whether it is the masks, whether it is even the medications. You can't even <clears throat> buy the medication in other countries because everybody is needing them. The pandemic is the one that's gonna cause a problem rather than the simple pneumonia from the virus. Yeah. Um, we, we lost your voice. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Yeah, we lost you a little bit, but you can hear you now. Okay. Well, in, in terms of uh, disease severity, we have seen from less severe disease, who can go home? Uh, I have been uh, discharging people to home in the last last week, and at least successfully, I discharged like four people uh, who went home uh, with uh, minimal oxygen support. But at the same time, we have seen like severe disease uh, who is still on the ventilator after 14 days. So um, we still have to figure out how is going to uh, change it, its characteristics. And we also get the information that we have been seeing like even the small kids in, involving in, in the disease process in the US, whether it is virus is mutating or whether it is we have new strains, we, we still don't know. So just okay. uh, stay tuned. Great. Thank you, sir, for that. And then we'll go to Dr. Anant next, who's also a hospitalist in uh, Irving, Texas. So you're on next. Hello, Bhaskar Garu and uh, Dr. Ismail, sir. Uh, thank you both for inviting me into this. And uh, hello, visitors. I'm uh, Dr. Chanta. I'm the hospitalist at uh, Fort Worth Hospital, which is actually a county hospital. County hospital means it's like a government hospital. It's actually the hospital uh, funded by the taxes paid by the particular county. It's called Tarrant County. The speciality of our hospital is majority are homeless, uninsured, and we don't have like the typical uh, commercial insurance based patients. So the reason why this is important in our hospital is till we get the community spread of coronavirus, we haven't seen that much hike in the cases. So which means the people who are in the hospital, who gets admitted to the hospital, they don't travel much. So <clears throat> they get, uh, till we have the community spread, then we started seeing more number of cases. So being a hospitalist, I do mainly admissions and I rarely round and discharge people. Mm -hmm. And uh, being the frontliner next to the ER physicians, so if the ER physicians has not covered the patients or if the patient did not manifest the COVID symptoms when they're getting admitted, it's really challenging when the patient gets into the floor and the nurses started panicking about no, we don't have any blood cultures, we don't have any sputum cultures, we don't have any source of infection, but the patient starts spiking fever. Then what's the cause? So then the panic starts not only just with the patient, families, and also the nursing staff, everybody. So what we have been seeing in the TV channels, the New York hospitals, is exactly reality, which me and Dr. Imam especially has been facing. So we both have been employed by Sound Physicians, which is a very good employer. So who has been training us very well every day with educating us with the advances in the COVID treatments. And also, so far we have been very safe. So we think that we are, we are COVID negative so far and our families have been safe. So I thank uh, my employer and my hospitals for that. So I would like to pass on the... <coughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. I think uh, you guys being hospital hospitalists, I think uh, you're next to the front line, which is which is actually a very important job to take care of many of the people that are coming in. So I'm going to go to next to Dr. Srividya Sridharagaru. Uh, she is um, she is immunologist and allergist. So that means very close to the problem space. I think everyone is, but uh, this is a lot more valuable from the point of view that uh, we need to improve our immun immunization levels or immunity levels, that is. So I will do less, do less uh, doctor <clears throat> technical talk and I'll leave it to you guys. So please, uh, Dr. Sridharagaru. 
you need to unmute. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hello, all. Uh, I'm Srividya Sridhar. Um, I'm an allergist um, and immunologist. I also take care of asthma, uh, mainly practice in Plano and Murphy, Texas. Um, basically, this has been a, a challenge in, in a few forms. I will go into details probably later, but from, from the standpoint of asthma, especially because it is uh, categorized under one of the high risk uh, lung, chronic lung conditions, wherein patients with COVID can have uh, more significant uh, related to the respiratory system. Uh, so it, we have been working uh, mainly to keep their asthma under control. And that's one thing. The second thing is I do take care of immune deficiency patients, especially people who have a certain type of immune deficiencies, be it primary, uh, which are by birth, or secondary from different uh, immune suppressants that patients take related to any other condition like <coughs> uh, or certain type of oncology drugs. Those are also people who are at high risk for contracting COVID and also um, having, you know, when you are on immune suppressants, it is very hard to control the viral replication. It continues to prolong that. So we're working um, mainly with those patients too to keep things under control. And the third thing is uh, this is the spring season. <coughs> and, uh, the, a lot of people are having spring allergies. Uh, some of the symptoms of COVID and uh, uh, allergies, they, they are very similar. So patients uh, do freak out. Most, most years, in most years, people always used to think they have allergies even when they have a viral infection. Now it's the opposite. They think they have COVID. So it is important to educate and reassure and be with the patient. Uh, end of the day, we don't want them to go to ER uh, our urgent care is unnecessarily. We don't want them to get get some kind of a COVID there after going there. So it's it's been a challenge. Uh, we're working with uh, our patients. There are quite a few patients who have uh, asthma, very severe asthma, and they are in need of certain type of injections called biologic medications. So we are keeping our doors open. I am. Um, continuing to take care of, the, of those patients and uh, converting some patients into telehealth and televisits as much as possible in order for them to not come to the office as much. So I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that any viewers have and happy to be part of this panel. Thank you. Um, so, so thank you for that, uh, Dr. Sridharu. And then next we'll go to uh, Dr. Ketu, sir, um, uh, you are, uh, sorry, um, uh, gastroenterologist from Richardson, yeah. Texas. Yeah, uh, sir, welcome. Dr. Sripati Ketu, gastroenterologist in Richardson, Texas. I take care of both inpatients and outpatients with gastroenterology problems. Uh, when I round on my inpatients, I do come across COVID patients. We have 12 patients right now in the hospital with COVID and some of them with gastroenterology problem and other issues as well. So that's how I get involved in their care. One, one thing I can tell, just to give you ground reality, because that's what we are talking about. Mm -hmm. I've been practicing medicine for the past 25 years in the US. I've never seen such an unprecedented health crisis in the US where there is so much anxiety about, you know, safety of the healthcare personnel and the safety of the patients and this is, uh, we have never seen it because this is a, a health crisis that we have not seen before. And it's hard to, uh, you know, gauge the, uh, you know, enormity of it because, you know, we don't have the right treatment for it. There is no vaccine for it and it is spreading so fast. Um, in the US, I think just to give you an idea, first five, there are 10,000 deaths in the US so far. First 5,000 deaths happened in one month. The second 5,000 happened in five days. So you can see how the number of deaths are increasing. So I think in the next month or so, it's going to peak as what they're expecting is, as per the statistics in Texas, where I practice, it's going to peak around the first week of May. So we are 
bracing for the worst. And so far, you know, like I said, the numbers are low. In Texas, we have about 8,000 cases as of this morning and 153 deaths. I'm sure it's going to unfortunately increase in the next month or so. And uh, we, we have uh, some issues like, you know, getting the personal protective equipment and, you know, getting the test done in timely manner and getting the results. It is still taking 24 hours to get the results, which is a little bit frustrating, but at least, you know, uh, more people are being tested. So uh, we are moving forward. I, we, uh, we are making progress. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that. And then next we'll go to Dr. Prasad Babugaru from India, I believe. Sir, Dr. Prasad Garu, can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, we can hear you, sir. Yeah. So, good morning to, okay, uh, to all the panelists uh, who are sitting across with us. And uh, uh, I know, I think, uh, we're all going through uh, a lot of crisis at this point of time, especially you guys in the US. And uh, still the problem in, in, our, in India is, I think, uh, uh, it's only just a starting phase we are facing in our country. Primarily, I'm a sur surgeon. I do uh, gastrointestinal surgeries. So this point of time, uh, uh, I'm not uh, taking care of uh, in, uh, treating the COVID patients. But uh, what we, we had done was like, you know, uh, we have cut down our uh, uh, elective surgeries, basically primarily to decrease the load, hospital load on elective cases and uh, allocating all the resources uh, for the, to treat the COVID patients. Uh, this point of time, uh, uh, the uh, cases are, uh, I think, around 4,500 uh, like that in the India. I think the only uh, downside is uh, we are not doing uh, much tests the way uh, US, uh, they are doing, I think, uh, about it, and, uh, closely around 10,000 tests per day in this uh, country. And uh, so far, the government policy has been only, you know, uh, uh, treating the primarily uh, in targeting the people who have traveled abroad on the immediate close contact people they have been uh, targeting. I think coming days, I think uh, rapid kits also now uh, available. Uh, the government is uh, uh, hope uh, target uh, trying to target more uh, people and uh, hoping to do more, more, more and more tests. Uh, we might expect a surge in uh, numbers in the in India. Okay. So we are all worried because after uh, seeing uh, Italy and uh, UK and US. So uh, those uh, countries with a lot of uh, advancements in medical field and also infrastructure, uh, still they are struggling. And we're also worried about uh, uh, what's going to happen to India at this point of time. OK, yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you for uh, giving us uh, the reality or what's happening in India. <clears throat> Next, we'll go to Dr. Arla Garu, uh, Arla Garu, who is a cardiologist, a very international cardiologist, actually, a very renowned one across the Dr. Fraternity, sir, thank you for joining today's session. Uh, your perspective, sir, please. Thank you, Bhaskar Garu and uh, Ismail for inviting me for this panel. As you all know, this is a very new, and still we are all learning about this virus. I've been there for two, three months, but still every day we are learning a new thing. But I consider it as a natural disaster, like any other natural <laughs> disaster. So. It happened, but we can't, we don't have much control on that. Because for this also, we don't have vaccine so far and we don't have medicine, but I hope we know we will get over it. But I'm a cardiologist. Today, I'm going to briefly explain uh, what is the effect of this virus on the heart diseases and uh, is heart patient is more prone for disease or prognosis is bad because of this coronavirus and the heart disease. So I'm going to explain when my turn my turn comes. Um, so it's right now we are we right now we cancel all the elective procedures. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I think I lost. Yeah, yeah. So we cancel all the elective procedures and we are seeing patients and we are doing the telemedicine. So when my turn comes, I will I'm going to explain a little bit briefly about the effect of coronavirus on the heart. 
Okay, thank you. Can I explain now or just say can wait? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead now, sir. Go ahead now. We'll, we'll come back to with questions later. Okay. Go ahead and explain the effect of uh, coronavirus on the heart. I think a lot of people are interested in knowing that. Yeah, a lot of uh, one question is: is heart patients are more prone for coronavirus? We don't know. Maybe not. But the, as everybody knows, the heart patient <laughs> it is a comorbid condition. The prognosis is uh, very bad. The, usually, the death rate is two to three percent in general public. But in the heart patients and diabetics and renal patients, cancer patients, it's up to 13% to 20% mortality. That's the literature saying. Uh, how coronavirus is affecting the heart in two ways. One is a direct effect. Like any viral effect, like viral cardiomyopathy, it affects the heart muscle and causes myocarditis. That means the inflammation of the heart muscle. Because of this, the troponin, that is the proteins released from the heart muscle, and it looks like a heart attack. Most of the time, it is not a heart attack. So the enzymes released because of the inflammation of the uh, heart tissue. That is one. Number two, the damage is because of the cytokine storm. The cytokine storm also causing uh, cardiomyopathy and heart disease. Uh, arrhythmias are very common. Almost like 17% uh, of the patient get arrhythmias, like atrial fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia, this is one of the cause for the death. Uh, the another thing is acute heart attack, how we are dealing with acute heart attack now. Before any acute heart attack, we take directly to the cath lab, but now we are not taking them to the cath lab. We are giving the clot buster medicine, which is the thrombolytics, which we used to give in 1970s and 80s. But now we are giving back uh, thrombolytics. First to them, if they are stable, we are treating medically. And if they're not stable after three to six hours, then we are taken to the cath lab with the complete protection. So these are the some points uh, how we are doing with the heart problem. And the sir, special sir. Because... Any question? No, no, go ahead. Wait, special wait, precautions for the heart patient as any other patient, you know, you got to be more careful. And uh, same thing, isolation and uh, social distance. Uh, and take care of the other comorbid conditions. Sir, sir, one specific question for you, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, which as a health healthcare professional, uh, I'm more worried actually. And we are a lot of, lot we are hearing about HCQ and uh, azithromycin combination. And uh, our guys are crazy about it, running behind the HCQ, you know, as a prophylactic and taking this. What's your take on that? <laughs> How safe yeah. it is for the how safe it is for the healthcare professionals to take and general public to take? Well, it's a good question. At this point, they are not recommending for the general public and the health professionals and uh, who got corona positive, uh, they are giving hydroxychloroquine. But there is uh, the mechanism still nobody knows exactly how it works. And the other one, Jitromax. Now they are not recommending Jitromax. They they used to give Jitromax and hydroxychloroquine hydroxychloroquine combination, but now Jitromax is no more a recommendation by hydroxychloroquine as per your question for health professionals and who is positive for corona is the only indication at this point, but not for the general public. Okay, so very good question, and great response. So next we're gonna to go to uh, Dr. Uh, Ram Vinaygaru, uh, Dr. Ram Vinay Srivatsa, who is actually an infectious disease specialist uh, sir, I think uh, Dr. Fauci is probably the most uh, well-known worldwide uh, right now. He's a household name. Uh, he's in the same genre of your specialization. So we'd like to hear from you. Thanks for having me here. So uh, I'll get to the real practical practical points here. You know? So um, there is, I don't think there's any point in talking about treatment here because nothing works. Nothing is improved. Okay? So the audience is mostly from India and here, right? Mostly Indians, right? Audience. So, mostly I mean, right. we, we, I have published it to my wider network, so a lot right. of uh, okay. so, other people are watching too. So. You know, have, after having seen all these things, the only thing that works that will save our planet is prevention. Okay, There's absolutely no point in talking about treatment because nobody knows if, if this treatment works. You know, it's, it's chloroquine versus azithromycin. So the only thing we can, we can do right now is prevention, prevention, prevention. There is no other choice right now. So I'm, I'm so happy that uh, the Indian government took very drastic measures to put our country to lockdown, I think they have to follow really strict uh, protocols there. I think we need to continue for two more months. Okay? 
Next one is we need to have enough PPE in case. Okay, and you need to prepare doctors in case back home then. Okay, because this country having so much of resources and being the most affluent country in the world, I would say it failed. Okay, it failed, you know, because uh, uh, but a couple of things, um, the, death, the, the percentage of death is 3% on average for, uh, for, for this disease, right? For example, in uh, Germany, the death rate is much, okay? But Italy, death rate is much higher because the old population, you know, all those things, right? So, but you never know what the death rate is going to be in India. Okay? There are so many hypotheses coming out, but these hypotheses are never, never proven yet. Right, so we can't say this hypothesis are right or wrong until we go through this season, okay? Mm -hmm. But uh, <clears throat> so prevention, 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 that's the only thing, it's very, very important, okay? Either you lock, you lock it down, stop travel, PPEs, you know, uh, educate people and whatever you do. But one good thing in India, you know, one thing is there is a research going on in, uh, uh, Dr. Robert Gallo is heading the research. Uh, he's a you know, renowned uh, IT doctor. Uh, in, uh, I, I forgot the university. So, but he, they're doing a research on whether seasonal pattern of COVID-19, they're strongly believing that the heat will control this, mm. the heat. So I have a, that's my hope and okay. wish that the heat will help our country and uh, my area, Arizona too. So, <laughs> thank so you we don't have thank any cases in Arizona right so, now. Interestingly, yeah. because our uh, hospital expected to uh, increase the number of cases, but two things are working. Number one is um, social distancing. Number two, the heat. I think these two are working here because the cases are not too many here in Arizona right now. Because of that. Sri, 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 I'd like to have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, it's like being an infectious disease specialist, can you explain the pattern? World, whole world is not getting the point that uh, the very, the death rates and mortality rates across the very well known countries is more than the poorer countries here. It, this has become a disease of rich countries. Is there any two different strains or two different patterns you are observing by your observations? Any light on that, please? It's mainly ep epidemiology, right? If you look at uh, China, from China, from Wuhan, most of the international tra travelers went to New York and Seattle and main cities. If you look at the pattern, how many people left China on that month, right? So from, from those cities, they traveled to other, other, other cities. So they traveled to Italy, those things, but not too many people went to India, right? Not too many people went to Bangladesh. So it's not about whether the rich country trans has more or poor country has less. It's the transmission. If you look at the epidemiology, you can connect all the dots. Got it. Got yeah. it. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And then uh, one that we have next, we'll go to uh, Raghu. We'll, go, we'll take you at the end. I'm, I'm going to now go to the youngest of the lot, uh, Dr. Manoj Madali. Madali. Uh, he is an impressive young man. Uh, from what I, little I learned from his mom, uh, he's, uh, he's actually, he actually volunteered to be in the ICU for uh, COVID-19. So that's amazing. He's actually a resident, third year resident at the UCSF. Uh, Dr. Manoj uh, Madali, welcome. And then I would like to hear from you because you were actually dealing with this more hands-on. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Baskar for inviting me. By the way, I'm not a doctor. Uh, I know Dr. Shailajagar referred me as well, but I'm not a doctor. <laughs> Dr. Raghu, my brother is a doctor. So I'm just... I'm just so honored to have you all, have you all here, that's all. <laughs> oh, thank you for inviting me. So the first, there's two points that I wanna make. The first point is, um, so in the, I've been in the ICU taking care of COVID patients and it affects everyone. So we have people as young as 32 years old on a ventilator and we have people as old as 85 years old on a ventilator. So it doesn't spare anyone across age. Of course, older patients and patients with comorbidities worse mortality and worse outcomes. But younger, last night we had to intubate a 32 year old uh, breathing tube down their throat for COVID. Um, so it's, it doesn't spare anyone is the first thing that I wanna, that I wanna get across. And the second thing that has been echoed on this group already is none of the treatments really work. And there's several clinical trials for hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, Remdesivir, uh, several of these things. But for now, nothing works. 
and preventionist way to, to treat this uh, and social distancing. So one example of this here in San Francisco, we had our first case of COVID one month before New York did, but we lost you for a bit. Currently we have uh, you know, several hundred cases in San Francisco mm -hmm. compared to tens of thousands of cases. Yeah, I think a hundred thousand cases in New York city. Um, so we're able to currently manage the, the number of patients and, and everyone has PPE and the hospital is not overwhelmed right now. When I talk to some of my friends and colleagues, it's unthinkable what they're seeing. What and I PPE think the real mean? difference is the social distance, what uh, the, the mask and the protective equipment. Okay. So we have enough masks for all the doctors and all the patients. Whereas um, some of my friends that I talk to in New York, they're given one mask and they say, you have to use that mask for the entire week or the entire month, even if it gets dirty or torn. Um, and that's just because they're so overwhelmed by the number of cases. Uh, and I think that's because the social distancing happened too late there. And because they're in really close knit quarters, like they have the subway and, and it's a very densely populated city. So that makes me afraid for India. Um, when you look at the, you know, some of the slums in Mumbai or Hyderabad or some of these other places, the people live very, very close together. So it's really, really important for people to stay at home and, and not go out. Uh, one worry that I have about, about India is tests. So people say that there's four or 5,000 documented cases in India, but realistically, it's probably five, 10 times that amount because people haven't been diagnosed yet. And people are going to be getting this illness and are going to die from this illness and they're not going to be accounted. Um, I think the Indian government will need to provide some kind of humanitarian aid for all the people who have to stay at home and not work. Um, because where are they going to get food and shelter from? I mean, even in America, I talked to several patients yesterday who lost their jobs in San Francisco, and mm -hmm. they're having to put their entire rent and their food on their credit card um, because they have no source of income. Uh, and that's in America. Imagine how difficult it is in India. Um, so I, I think there's a lot that needs to be done. I commend the Indian government on instituting uh, the lockdown so early and so rapidly, and that's really going to save millions of lives. And there's more that we need to do. That's great. Yeah, Dan, thank you, Dr. Nadali. And uh, I'm going to the last in the panel in the sequence is Dr. Raghunandan, who is actually in a different part of the world. He's in Kuwait, and uh, he's it's actually 4:30 a.m. for him. Uh, so he woke up. I mean, he, that's normal for mm -hmm. him. Uh, Dr. Raghunandan, see, uh, tell me what's going on in Kuwait. That's completely different part of the world. It's probably not on the map yet from a COVID point of view, or, but I see you uh, with your pictures and daily activity. There's a lot, uh, there is some activity, some, some things going on there as well. So your turn, please. Yeah. Hi. Hi to everyone in the panel. Mm, I'm a family physician. I used to talk about the family always. Any disease, how it impacts the family. That was my problem. And this corona affected the world family. I feel that this is a world family. Now, everyone, everyone under the only one umbrella now, COVID. No one, it is sparing no one. <laughs> it's it's, a, it's ba bad or good, it's happening. As our uh, infectious disease specialist so said, very, <laughs> it know. is. Uh, no, it is a kind of. <laughs> it's a bad one, bad one, of course. Okay. But the thing is, uh, as uh, our infectious disease specialist said, prevention is the only best thing. Only best thing. There is, we can argue hundreds and thousands anytime. I will take this medicine, I will, get, I will not get the corona. It will not happen like that. So stay home, stay safe is the message flowing away everywhere in the world. How long? I think none of these uh, panelists will know about that question. How long? Nobody it will give me it. Nobody yeah, it, it may go on. It may go on for any time. But to save the lives, as one of my just uh, junior most colleague was uh, pointing out that uh, India br bring down the lockdown very early. That's, that saved millions or millions of lives. So what happening in Kuwait is, what's happening in Kuwait is, unfortunately, we are in stage three of the spread. I think my panelists all know what it means. It is spreading in the community already. Uh, 
So we are getting, uh, we have some worse slum areas than uh, India, and it is into that slums already. So what the government is doing is, uh, it's completely, it's not even a lockdown, it's a complete curfew for us. Only healthcare professionals are moving around in the uh, country. And uh, so the control is very nice. And the sp mortality rate is only one death amongst all the cases for us. Just because this happened because of this curfew, we are doing it for past two months. Two months we are on curfew and we are sitting at home. So my advice to everyone, whoever it is, in the, uh, not in the panel, who are watching this panel is, don't risk by having a mask. I can go out and sneak out and do my workout and I will run out. No, this is at home, at home and at home. This is my take home message for all of you guys who are watching the YouTube. And thank you for all the guys who joined with me, with us in this Be Positive Thank you for everyone for your inputs. Awesome. So with that uh, message, I'm going to take some questions that been, that's been coming to us. Close to 100 plus people are watching. I'm sure um, they're all intriguingly following the discussion. I'm going to relay some of the questions that my, you know, some of my friends have been helping me uh, to correlate. The very first question is from uh, Mr. Jeremy Gregg. So the question, anybody from the panel can take this. What do you think about the medical schools that are working to graduate their medical students early so that they can rapidly move into this practice? So Dr. Madali may be the right person to answer this. There is uh, a motion for rapidly graduating them. So uh, anybody in the panel can take this actually. Yeah, I can take that question. So uh, NYU was the first medical school to offer voluntary early graduation. So two weeks ago, they said their medical students can graduate, I think, in early April. Uh, they won't be paid if they start working on, in the hospitals, and they still need to be supervised. So I think if it's done in a careful fashion, um, it's an acceptable thing to do just to get more bodies in the hospital, because there's not enough doctors in the hospital. Not enough doctors. That being said, uh, you know, Go ahead. These, these new graduated medical students still need to be supervised by uh, more senior physicians, because it you know, having a, a brand new doctor practice without any supervision is just as dangerous as not having a doctor there. It might actually be more dangerous. Um, so as long as it's done in yeah. a safe fashion, in a controlled fashion, it might be reasonable. Yeah. So let's go to some senior doc senior doctors and see what they say about it. Well, Bhaskar, Dr. Sinos Reddy. Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, this is considered as a, a special situation, like a war. When the war is there, there is a, a reserve army like that. The mm -hmm. graduating medical students of the reserve army, uh, as Dr. Madali said, definitely they need to be supervised, but we can use them. Uh, I, have a, I have a situation. related question. So similar to doctors, uh, there is a shortage of nurses. I can be, I can imagine. Uh, they are the ones that are probably spending a lot more time next to the patients, uh, watching them close in ventilation and all that. So, yeah. what do you? How do you think U.S. is handling shortage of nurses? Uh, sir, Dr. Alagar, if you have information on that or uh, ideas about it or anybody. Well, you know, as we know so far, they're talking about this uh, graduating, the uh, graduating students they want to use. But nurses, actually, we haven't heard. Anybody heard in the panel? I, I never heard about nurses. Any no, shortage I, on nurses? I, I can answer that. I don't think there is shortage of nurses unless, you know, a lot of nurses get sick as we go into this crisis more. Right now, at least in Texas, all the hospital... Uh, systems. There are the four major hospital systems, including Baylor, THR, and all that. They're doing a very good job in protecting the nurses. I know that they've increased their pay, especially if they're working in COVID floors because of the increased risk. And if they're doing overtime, they're paid more. So they're doing all kinds of things and they have psychological mm -hmm. counseling and uh, rapid testing. They have every day they can go and get it tested if they're exposed to COVID patients. So they're taking all those precautions. Right now, there is no shortage. As far as going back to that other question about graduating the medical students early, I, I think, you know, especially if they're in the last few months of their, uh, um, you know, medical school, it may not be such a bad thing. They need to be supervised, but at least, you know, there'll be more bodies to take care of the patients. And Italy has done that successfully. And if we get to that point of, 
where Italy was, I think it's definitely needed and uh, it's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. I, I will I will add on to this uh, idea of uh, bringing in the junior most into this war. It's a bi-edged sword like. It has both edges. It has a manpower supply for us. In the same time, we are bringing in a primitive doctor who don't know to care himself first. This scenario demands a, an extreme care for the doctor. Uh, for the physician who is attending any COVID physician because his life is more valuable than as valuable as the patient whom he is attending. But I, I think these primitive guys may not be able even to understand how well they need to be protected when taking care of these COVID cases. So as all the panelists are telling, they must be educated properly and they must be put into the war field, I think. Because we all we all already got education from different experiences of before epidemics, pandemics, everything we have seen. But they are entering into a pandemic world directly. They must be they must be properly educated and trained for that. That's what my take is. Okay, we'll go to other questions. Hi, we'll go to other. Go ahead. Sorry, Thank you. this one question from India industry. So okay. it's just uh, it's better idea of taking this uh, graduated students from into the field of uh, COVID management. One thing I can say is you can properly guide them. Instead of you can more the preventive measures you can take them along for management of acute cases and all. So they can explain to the public regarding the various preventive measures you want to be taken and all. Regarding management, of course, and the proper supervision of super uh, like your senior consultants, they can be taken care of also. That's Especially right. in India, what is happening is the people instead of taking younger graduates, they're taking more retired persons who into the action because they can mm -hmm. guide their experiences, they can guide the coordinate the things which is most useful for the management of court cases. So retired doctors are probably a better... More recruiting into things so that they can, at least they can understand the situation, they can coordinate the things which are required at uh, each faculty level. That's, that's amazing. So next I question. I just wanted uh, to add one thing. It's totally yes, optional. It's totally optional and no medical student is forced to graduate as per the AMA uh, Ethics uh, Medical Association. <laughs> so it's totally optional and uh, nobody is compelled to. That's a good. That's a good point. And before that, one one uh, important uh, point uh, uh, just got, um, because if, if there are anybody any uh, hello yeah go ahead uh, how, how go about ahead. now yeah so um, what's happening is uh, uh, if 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 the patients, if a lot of them are uh, getting positive also, like uh, for example, in Florida, one of my uh, friends is a cardiologist and they had like four pulmonologists, out of which like three are uh, in quarantine. So they had the cardiologist has to take care of the management and all. Um, but uh, uh, if, if there are some, some persons who are positive, I think they are, they are better uh, because they have immunity. So they, they, we have to see if any in the medical field, like if they're COVID uh, positive and then they, they got uh, recovered, they are the best persons, uh, even like. Your voice is breaking. Yeah. So Dr. Ismail, we lost you. Your voice is gone. Okay, so what we'll do is uh, we, have, we have a lot of questions. So my request to the panel because there are about 19 questions that came up. So what we'll do is we'll keep our responses brief and then, uh, and then uh, maybe one or two people chime in with views. Uh, so the next question is, how long does the virus survive on hard surfaces? This is from Kishore Nare. And there are different versions on the, of, about that on the internet. And uh, there is a one I would, a related question or a question that is next to that is doctors, how to differentiate between regular cold, I think uh, regular cold cough versus COVID symptoms. So two questions, how long the virus live on hard surfaces because there is a lot of conflicting information. And then how do you differentiate between cold cough versus COVID symptoms? Well, um, Bhaskar, I can, I can answer this question. Sure. Well, uh, once the air, once the virus uh, expels into the air from the patient, uh, it can still sitting in the air, floating in the droplets for at least 
few hours. It, it may be 15 minutes or it may be uh, one hour or two hours. Uh, we, we still have uh, not have a conclusive answer. But according to the studies, what we have uh, from the last couple of months, the virus can stand on the copper up to four hours. And if, if it is the same thing on, on the cardboard, it, it can stay up to 24 hours. And uh, they have seen it is sitting on the plastic and steel, stainless steel for up to 72 hours. Yeah. And from the, from the ship, what they found is some virus particles that was sitting there for days. But nobody knows that whether those are the full viruses that can cause the infection or not. Those are the, the breakdown parts of the viruses. Um, in terms of differentiating between common cold and cough with the COVID, basically, if you have the common cold, it's usually the symptoms in the upper spirit tract. That means people will have sneezing, people have uh, runny nose, and the uh, they have like uh, itching kind of stuff. But when, when it goes to the COVID, most people will have fever. Uh, at least 90% of the people, even though the symptoms won't start until day three or day four of the infection, they will have the uh, shortness of breath. They have the cough. They might not produce any sputum. They still might have the dry cough and fever. Those are the two important things. And most of the people will have the weakness, fatigue, uh, loss of energy, Okay. And some, they have the GI symptoms too, like diarrhea and nausea and vomiting, but those are very uh, unusual. Excuse and me, I will, I, will like to, I will like to add on to that uh, flu and uh, differentiation between COVID and flu. Okay, as, as my colleague was telling, this is absolutely correct. Only one symptom, what I observed being a screening patient and dealing with the COVID patients is the fever. Fever, fever, fever. High-grade fever is the first indication with a dry cough for COVID. Not all that sneezes is a COVID. Not all that coughs is a COVID. Please take it. Those, those non-medical who are watching, not all sneezes is not a COVID. Don't get <laughs> panic with that. Okay. Only high-grade fever with cough. That too starts after the day three or day four of the symptoms. Day three or day four of early running nose, that only the one goes to worst of COVID. I would like to ask Dr. Sridhar uh, so her opinion because she's an immunologist. Yeah. I, the same question? Can yeah, same question. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, so I think the second question, which is mainly what is the main differentiation, I, I think I agree with what they said. High fevers with uh, lower respiratory symptoms, common cold. Uh, is typically caused by rhinovirus and you will see more of uh, sneezing and runny nose, My low grade fever. Most people would have immunity to common cold and you will see the symptoms more in a child who is still trying to develop immunity versus an adult. A common cold is a, is a very, very simple thing. And a lot of people don't even know that they are fighting a viral infection as an adult because your body already knows how to fight it off. And it just does it uh, as a matter of a uh, you know, simple thing. And whereas in COVID, you, your body does not, uh, corona, novel coronavirus, uh, you, you do not have immunity. So your immune system is trying to fight it off and also develop immunity uh, for future infection in the process. So usually initial infection it always carries a very high fever because of that reason. Um, and uh, well, like, like everybody else said, like any other viral infection, it can affect upper respiratory system, lower respiratory system, which will present with coughing, shortness of breath, and, uh, and also some GI symptoms. Heart can be affected, nervous system can be affected. It is affecting full body, but like someone said, it is a in a pandemic situation, the spread is rapid. So uh, because you do not have immunity to this new or novel coronavirus, the spread is rapid. And so you will see very quick onset of uh, symptoms too. But for some people, it is being asymptomatic. The question is, are there different strains of the virus? Uh, or is, is it 
some people are responding uh, better to that virus because of some other immunity that they are possessing. I'm not sure. As far as um, another question is how much of initial viral load they are being exposed to and is that leading to some amount of excessive symptoms from the get-go? I would like the infectious disease doctor's opinion on that. Like, in, is, does the initial viral load actually matter uh, is one question I actually have. Because I, I am seeing that the frontline uh, physicians and nurses are being affected more than uh, people who have not been exposed to as much initial viral load uh, or viral toxin. So does that matter? And and then the second question is, is there, I think uh, WHO and other people are also bringing up, is there, is it just droplet or is there airborne? Uh, effect to it. So I would I would actually be interested to learn from them. Sri, Sri, you can take those two questions. Yeah. Thanks for those uh, very good questions. So in, uh, it's called inoculum. Inoculum is a very important thing for any infection, not just for this one. So the amount of viral load you get exposed to initially will really matter. So if you get exposed to very low viral load, it may actually be good, you know, because, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, because it'll prob probably give you some immu immunity, right? But if you get exposed to a, a huge viral load, then there is a risk of getting a big infection and respiratory failure and all those things. So infection, uh, burden, and uh, ex getting exposed to high viral load makes a difference in uh, pathology. That's number one. That's why when they, when they intubate the patient, it's, you're, they're getting exposed to very high viral load. And also, I don't think they're recommending BiPAP because with BiPAP, uh, you're uh, um, aerosolizing all the respiratory secretions. So BiPAP, uh, a lot of people are not doing BiPAP because of the risk of uh, uh, um, uh, you know, viral uh, aeros aerosolization. So, and then second question, what was the second question about? About uh, 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 airborne, uh, right? Uh, yeah, drop yeah. Versus airborne. So here's the thing. Um, this is definitely very highly infectious virus, you know, but uh, it's more infectious than influenza. Influenza is just droplet. So, but I would say it's definitely more than droplet. That's my personal opinion. And uh, I'm not sure if it's airborne or not, uh, but uh, CDC recommends using N95. And if you don't have N95, use droplet, surgical mask, okay? And they themselves are confused. I think CDC guidelines, this is strictly my opinion, CDC made recommendations not based on science. They made recommendations based on supply. So I would say use a 95 or double mask or be very careful. Also, uh, second thing is the contact. Contact is very, very, uh, uh, people uh, ignore contact, uh, you know, but make sure, you know, you have uh, uh, full PPE gloves and gowns and everything. When you go home, you got, you know, uh, head, uh, head to toe shower, you know, uh, that's uh, those two, two things are very important. So I'm gonna combine a few questions that, you know, people have been asking. There are a lot of questions coming. Uh, there's one general, I'm gonna generalize some of the questions that people have asked around uh, anybody that's got infected, uh, say they process a food like a cut a chicken or a meat and then meat gets packaged and gets distributed through refrigerated meats. Would the virus live through that mechanism uh, is one, one question. And second, related or not related, at least around uh, people taking medicines for different infections. For example, somebody's taking uh, azithromycin or uh, Zyrtec for uh, regular infections. Do they actually uh, help or harm if they have COVID or this kind of a strain. So two related, two questions. One, would it travel from the person to if they're handling food and then go through refrigerated mechanism, would it live through that? And second is the medicines that people are taking for other infection, uh, for Zyrtec and uh, other, uh, you know, azithromycin, hydrochloro, uh, those things the virus, virus lives through refrigeration. So you have to clean the, all the packets and everything before you refrigerate it. So uh, there are some articles or some videos uh, from media. You know, uh, so you can watch those videos, how to clean your food. But the virus lives through uh, uh, refrigeration. But would it, would it go from a person that has infection to the meat if they're handling meat or any food items? If you have it on the hand, if you have it on the meat package, definitely. Mm -hmm. 
That's what I'm talking about. That's very important. You know? As a lot of people think it's only droplet, you know, by coughing, right? Mm. But by touching is very important. Okay. Thing. When you go to store, you push carts, you know, that's where a lot of uh, transmission is happening. Okay. The and if they take they're taking any medication like Zyrtec or uh, azithromycin. And we don't have any evidence to say if they help or if they do anything. So it's, uh, we could have no comments on that. Okay. And then uh, please. Uh, adding, uh, adding, uh, adding on to this refrigeration, uh, if we go back to the history, SARS, this is the same family group of viruses. They used to survive up to six days and seven days in the refrigeration refrigerated food. So we have to be very careful and we have to cook very well the, any refrigerated food. As our uh, specialist said, must work the, wash the packages properly before you are refrigerating. Because SARS has got a worse history and this virus is the same family. So maybe it may lead in the same way. That's mm -hmm. the thing. Mm -hmm. I have another set of questions. So I'm going to, this is an interesting question from Prasad Rani. So he says, uh, for anybody in the panel, do we maintain social distancing among the family members as well? I have known some some of my friends. In fact, even we do. We're sleeping in separate rooms. So, and then uh, the intimate relationship with a significant other. Uh, how do we have to take care of these things as well? Do, can we have dinner together with the family within the house? If one yeah. person is a healthcare worker, we have to keep him away. Okay. Yeah. Unfortunately, other, every, yeah, you don't have to. If uh, if nobody's in healthcare. But if somebody has a reasonable risk factors, you know, got to keep them away. Uh, otherwise, we can, you know, have dinner together. You know, as long as all four or five of you stay together, doing the same thing every day, there's no reason to social distancing among the family. Uh, one, but do not. Yeah, one, to... one more, one more question. I want to bring in Prabhakar Naidu for this. How how happily the families can live in this situation? Can you can you enlighten as being a psychologist, psychiatrist, Mr. Prabhakar, Dr. Prabhakar? Can you tell us how the family can be together without a medical specialist being in the family? Dr. <laughs> uh, Rago, mm -hmm. so I am visiting uh, uh, in isolation ward uh, doctors and some quarantine center. So uh, most of our colleague doctors uh, uh, frequently asking me, just uh, one side we are facing a lot of pressure with the uh, management of COVID uh, uh, duties. Uh, more than that, we are facing a lot of problem with the family members. We, uh, they have uh, some people, family members and uh, neighbors. So their neighbors also uh, they are observing differently, and uh, we are forcefully avoiding children to come close together and uh, taking dinner like that. So actually, our medical people, doctors and uh, paramedical staff, they are facing a lot of problem both sides. So, uh, so there's a more stress among doctors. So, in the, with all precautions, uh, as our colleagues uh, said, but uh, we need to manage uh, uh, scientifically and uh, technically uh, but duties, especially having duties at COVID uh, uh, wards. The, uh, um, so, we, we need to follow the international guidelines how to uh, self quarantine or self isolation family members, how long. Uh, how to take care of the children, frequently counseling, uh, counsel them regarding the, uh, the safety of the duty doctors and the safety of the children and the other family members. Uh, and the fam uh, family members of doctors facing a lot of uh, pressures and uh, from neighbor uh, houses. And uh, in India, most of the doctors are staying in apartments. So they are feeling uh, some sort of uh, inconvenience. Uh, so we need to counsel the neighbors, we need to take care of ourselves, we need to uh, focus uh, more on some uh, uh, stress management techniques. So uh, first we need, no, need not worry too much about the uh, uh, COVID, so which in turn leads to a lot of uh, pressures and internally not getting, many doctors are calling me and asking, oh, I'm not getting sleep, I'm getting palpitations, I'm getting sweating, so I'm unable to concentrate on my duty. So I'm getting frequent calls from my wife and my children uh, are insisting me to take more care. And with uh, all inception, especially in India, no, no, India, uh, people are not having sufficient safety measures, uh, preventive measures. So, for example, uh, by, in our hospital, only uh, doctors who are dealing directly with the COVID patients.
we lost a little bit lost mm. the voice yeah and then you will continue uh, we were already uh, 15 and, minutes and over uh, answer answering to dr um, uh, prashad rani's question directly family can be very happily living together no worries about that okay. don't worry have, live happily together we have few more <laughs> whatever questions. way you want yeah we have few more questions so uh, before i take uh, answer the next question i have i want to welcome dr uh, uh, virinchi vivinti virivinti sorry virivinti uh i know you joined little thank late you, sir. sir thank you thank you for joining and welcome you are a younger yeah, cardiologist we have uh, we have a senior most cardiologist also on the panel and uh, dr thank virinchi you, sir, sir uh, w- what are you seeing uh, so far you heard some of the discussions that happened and uh, tell us your perspective on this yeah uh, thank you thank you welcoming sir actually uh, i'm a bit late and i could not follow because i i could not connect properly <laughs> so no 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 worries uh, no worries just now uh, just now i started hearing this uh, discussion so, because i could able to what we're asking is um, you know yeah. from a covid 19 situation uh, how are you seeing it in india you live in hyderabad so yeah, what are yes. you seeing there and uh, what is your general sense of situation yes sir, yes sir. so far the whatever the uh, official uh, is are coming around 400 people are being affected and about uh, death rates are also increasing in telangana especially and uh, actually initially they were have thought by uh, april 7th everything will be under control but uh, the things have been changed since then so we do not know i, I hope uh, it may take one more uh, week to assess because uh, right now we do not know any number of patients exactly being quarantined and how they are doing well or unwell we do not know so so far situation as of right now as of right now we cannot say exactly uh, it may take one more week for us to assess it okay as such so there are a couple of more questions which are generally not in the direction that were asked so far so one is um, is the pandemic situation would it affect younger doctors the people that are interested in medical careers would they either they get inspired or would it be a little more scary for them if you are in early 20s right now Uh, how do you think this would affect them so that i can take this person. one so yeah uh we can look back at previous epidemics like the hiv epidemic and there was a surge of new physicians and new infectious disease physicians that came as a result of that uh mm-hmm. and you can already hear in just the youth circles in san francisco that more people want to join the fight and you know particularly oh, wow. want to become infectious disease doctors uh so i think i think people will be inspired as a result of this people are inspired to join that's awesome yeah people, it, it, this must be a more motivating factor mm-hmm. and inspiring factor for the all younger generation to join the hands and clap together that's okay, right all together yeah i think uh, baskar this is the first time at least they are considering the doctors as a heroes so mm-hmm. that's why this this will definitely <laughs> inspire the inspire the younger generation i don't think it will doctors uh, have always been the heroes but now the world no, is no but at uh, least you know we are, we are getting a little special uh, recognition getting, and considering heroes see see i think my panel will accept that some of us got uh, influenced by some of the diseases heard in the in our childhood that yeah. my parents has got cancer my parent has got this one if parents got or some relatives got and we became doctors whole world got the disease so there is no way it will depress the people it will it will inspire <laughs> yeah it, it will inspire, inspire more yeah i want to yeah. hear from Dr. professor sampath on that yeah yes. uh, like in sense like uh, not only this pandemic which is five people to become a doctor so in general uh, one common notion goes in family is every family want to have a doctor in the family at least to take care of them and take care of the family first of all that's first thing is always people feel like i always feel like proud to be a doctor basically not only with this in epidemics and all people giving much importance i feel but always being a doctor i think you can uh, take care of yourself first and your family and you can show so to the people uh, that's all this inspires and all but during this pandemic i think uh, there are two things are going on the people are really feeling of course uh, uh, being a doctor they say something else and all this goodness some people are getting to peers also they can be listening to the various uh, false things going in the society through various media and all like uh, uh, by visiting people some people are getting more infections and becoming the sick and becoming all but as the information has to not be much propagated otherwise people will become very panic and may mm-hmm. not attend the duties properly also that both things in the ticket have consequences during the pandemic season now 
not only Excellent inspired, show. people are getting more of scared also. So yeah. you can the media and people like I think the way Bhaskar has taken up this program should inspire more of people to uh, be uh, prepared for things and inspire people to take up the challenge rather than becoming more scary and get away from goodies. Great, sir. Thank you for that. I think uh, very insightful thoughts on that. One with one final question. we will take uh, stop the audience questions then we will leave the panel open for 5 uh, minutes for a discussion among yourselves and then we'll wrap it up so this question uh, is from sarada uh, she is asking uh, how the scarcity of resources uh, i think uh, we heard doctor uh, say that we failed on some of this uh, in us especially scarcity of scarcity of resources at various levels is being managed and how we all can help as community Uh, after staying from home and face mask or can we do something at home for example uh, stitching face masks or can is it something that each person or family sitting at home contribute towards this resource scarcity let me correct this can you say one second let me correct yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. i did not say the system i said system fail but uh, it is not intentional you know because nobody yeah. would have thought we go get pandemic right so that's what it is you know we tried but uh, we have learned lessons from other people. so from this country india should learn lessons so india shouldn't fail go ahead i wanted Sorry. to say something uh, i think the best thing community as a community member you can do is uh, to do social to man, you know follow social distancing and uh, be you know be, be in there be you know be present you know understand what is happening and uh, try and avoid gatherings educate people who are doing so to whatever degree from a ppe standpoint uh, i think some of the members in the community are trying to help out uh, and uh, i actually had to go twice to get some n95 masks to be able to send it to new york hospital uh, mm-hmm. elmhurst which is at the epicenter uh, i know of a doctor who works there and uh, i ended up sending some n95s i have a couple and we are trying to rotate Uh, trying to do that, but from a community standpoint, I think the best thing is to follow the social distancing, take it more seriously. Um, and I think much of our community is doing it. It this is not a time to do some uh, family gatherings or uh, are you know, just friends getting together. It, it's not recommended at this point. This is not holiday time. Just because we are not working doesn't mean we have to. um socialize so i, I think most of us are, are understanding of that and that's a big thing to help out at this point and it actually helps the healthcare professionals also uh, in uh, in having less cases and not not running out of people and not having things go out of control okay that's great and dr ismail do you want to add anything yeah actually um can you hear me yeah so uh, i want to ask i want to ask the panel um, to ask question uh, to dr uh, uh, sri um anna yes. so uh, my question is uh, so th- th- there are this uh, uh, convalescent plasma which is used uh, for icu in in most of the serious cases so how good is uh, i mean uh, we don't know the data yet but uh, is it still and uh, my the point is uh, should we get a blood bank um, of like the blood um, blood donated by this uh, people who are uh, recovered from covid and uh, just keep it so is it a that is a theory part of it. that is a theory part of it but we don't know if it's going to actually work or not <clears throat> okay uh, it's a, it's a very cumbersome process and uh, uh very few people will probably actually will going to need it but uh, i'm not sure if it's really practical or not So, yeah. So the treatment option. Yeah, Sorry, we have so many treatment options. I think this is where you know IL six inhibitors, but these things are not practical because they're too expensive. We refuse apply. So go ahead, Sampat. Yeah, the my the point to the question is basically the convalescent serum mostly consists of IgG rather than IgM. So the IgG part, I think you take most of the viral infections in particular. 
they sometimes can be because of cytotoxic also not may all be humoral immunity only so if you take the conversion sera the most of antibody so it may not be suggestible purifiable also but what this was suggested still you have to see because how far it is useful and all because we will think of only one part of humoral immunity only what about like uh, uh, cellular immunity we doesn't have but in conversion sera most like icc which is things and all but then we have to see the results from the other uh, recovering countries with the studies are doing thank okay. you so i can join in on that too so i mean there's so many other treatments like remdesivir tocilizumab convalescent plasma there is a paper in jama which was published uh, about 10 days ago where they showed that five patients in the icu with um, with coronavirus improved after getting convalescent plasma but as was mentioned in the group it is so cumbersome to get if we don't even have enough of ventilators for patients we definitely can't give them convalescent plasma you have to go back to the basics right and imagine if you know a million people in in new york get it or in india there's just no way that we can give a million people convalescent plasma it's completely impractical and expensive and if the yeah. just to add to that fda approved uh, you know investigational uh, access to convalescent plasma as of few days ago UT Southwestern locally, they have like a uh, database. Uh, they are asking patients who recover from COVID so that they can, uh, you know, get their plasma for uh, using it for investigational purposes. If you know any patient who just recovered from COVID, I think it, you know, if they can volunteer and uh, contact UT Southwestern, they can, they can use that plasma. Uh, th this brings up a question from me. Uh, what if the what is the rate of recurrences? Have you ever any of this in the panel uh, observed any cases with recurred? I, I uh, do think there were reports of patients who've gotten it again, but it's unlikely. Yeah, very small percentage will have recurrence. I think there were few cases in Japan and few cases in China. For us in US, I think it's too early to tell because we just started seeing the spike in patients, but. Uh, Based on Japanese and the Chinese experience, there are a few reinfections. And one more question to the panel. Any, anyone can answer that. How long it will take to be a negative for the test? Is it only the 14 days? Because so many getting confused about that. We, we are hearing many patients getting negative only after 28 days or for 30 days. What does it mean, actually? I have seen patient getting negative yeah. only after 30 days. Raghu, so, Dr. Raghu, regarding this question, the only thing when you call patients completely non-infective or become negative, unless it proves to the RNA and viral antigens become negative. Any part of the illness, like the first week, second week, third week, fourth week and all. So, we can consider patient is negative for the infection or become non-infective unless it's become viral RNA and antigens become negative. This I am asking actually on behalf of the many audience the, who are watching us also because they have a lot of questions like this. How long it will stay on? We have seen the patients even getting negative after 30 days, but it takes its own course. We don't understand now, right now. Yeah. That is what I mean. Uh, the inoculum, right? Initially, the inoculum is very important. So if the patient has high infection burden, they're going to tend to carry the virus for a long time. But also, if the patient is immunocompromised, they're going to tend to carry the virus for much longer. So the patient is immunocompromised, failure failure in the event, you don't have this virus for a two, maybe three to four But the CDC believes that fourteen days will be the, the, day, the, the time for most of the patients. Fourteen days. See, adding to this, uh, Raghu. Uh, hello. Yeah, yeah. See, uh, I think uh, the four weeks is the time time frame. Majority of the people, I think they become negative. And uh, in, in, in India, what uh, I think uh, we have been practicing here is uh, uh, primarily depends upon the nasopharyngeal swabs, uh, real-time PCR they've been doing. So they consider usually two samples, consecutive time, samples, if they are negative in two hour, 24 hours apart. Uh, see, they, they are discharging the patients from the hospital and uh, still they are telling to get isolated from the family members. But contrary, there are certain reports, talks about, uh, you know, especially from China, the people have noticed the viral shedding in the pieces in the third and fourth week also. 
but this point of time we don't know the real uh, i mean uh, importance of uh, pico oral transmission of the virus so uh, with this uh, all uh, you know one can say that you know at least uh, four weeks uh, is a time frame where things become negative, negative. and probably and uh, you know one has to uh, uh, depend upon i think primarily on uh, uh, viral rna in the blood antigen test if one has to do then only i think one can declare whether he is negative or positive so in the interest of time right we want to uh, it's already uh, we talked about 1 hour 45 minutes which is a uh, uh, and time really passed i think a lot of viewers are asking interesting questions and they chimed in a lot uh, dr shailaja gar do you want to add anything to the discussions we have so far yeah um i just want to add uh, uh, please do not stop immunizations and uh, i think uh, dr shridhara will uh, agree as well especially for the kids and the newborn babies uh, so we are open for immunizations they need to get their shots because uh, i think uh, that's one scare should we get the immunizations in this period so please do not stop your regular immunizations also Uh, adding to what the psychiatrist said i do a lot of uh, neuro mental health and all that so there is a 1800 mental health uh, line available and uh, it's a lot of psychologists and psychiatrists are available on uh, video and on phone for free servicing uh, so please uh, make use uh, of uh, the online psychologists for any kind of mental stress whether it be a doctor or a kid or a child or uh, whoever so it's it's available 24/7 um i, I and uh, schools are offering psychologists and online classes and all the help they can and there's lot of free stuff around with the covid thing uh, starting from online music classes dance classes to everything so make yes. make use so, of tele services excellent dr anand sir do you have anything to add tell you guys yeah so to all the visitors the one thing that i want to tell you is please don't get scared of this disease this is one disease where we can prevent it just by simple measure social distancing cleaning yep. yourself cleaning the hands don't touch your face eye lips mouth anything and stop listening to whatsapp university start listening to your physician please <laughs> That is the main. That's problem. the greatest advice you can get. That's the greatest <laughs> advice you can get. So, uh, and, 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 and adding on to the community part, community part. Only one thing I keep telling. I think for past two months I made a lot of videos. Also, only one thing you need to tell is stay home, stay safe. Stay home, stay safe. Take home this one. And one of my close uh, sister, like uh, Sarada, asked question asking about stitching about the mask. Uh, you can contribute for ppes for different areas where there are no money you can contribute monetary wise and if you are technically sound enough to stitch the mask and you want to do it that's the most welcoming part because if public start stitching mask you can imagine there are some billions of mask stitch across chinese clo china's country if that happens in america the people sitting at home can stitch a mask in a technical way that's a great thing to do actually great and stay so, home Alagar, stay safe stay home stay safe dr alagar uh, unmute sir uh, yeah. as we all know there is a, a depression and anxiety is going on in the community actually nak kuda chaala calls vastunnayi ee madhya actually doctors lo kuda chaala mandi ki lot of doctors have this problem and general public have problem because of two things one is uncertainty of the present situation the number two uncertainty uncertainty of financial problems so right. these two are common but we got to general recommendation is accept the truth and to keep going be optimistic be positive and to talk to the friends talk to the friends talk to the family read the books and watch movies and be positive mm-hmm. i think personally i feel we are traveling in a tunnel i think definitely we are going to see the end of the tunnel but dark tarvata elugochinattu gaane the the light the light after the darkness is much brighter i hope this will be uh, so soon we will see the brightness sir i have a, one news item to share with you guys i know it, it came just minutes before uh, this panel has gone on air <clears throat> so i want to show you guys uh, this news and uh, i'm sharing my screen here oh. 
So this is about new coronavirus drug shows promise in animal tests. This is this came on uh, Apple News just an hour before we started, and it says a block of coronavirus behind COVID-19 replicating itself. Basically, they tested in laboratory, and FDA has approved testing on ten patients next month. And I I know you, there is something to grasp here if. Uh, you know, our uh, immunologist doctor can answer this. Um, infectious okay. disease doctor can answer this. Um, if we have got any immediate thoughts on that. So Dr. Ram Vinayagar. I, I have no comments on this. Okay, no problem. I just wanted to leave with some bright news that came out of news just uh, minutes ago uh, before we started. And with all that, I would like to thank the elite panel, the extremely talented and amazingly uh, what do you call patient and heroic? I have no adjectives to describe what you guys are doing because it's it's just phenomenal. The fact that Dr. Sai Heroes has been recognized by worldwide right now is a great thing. It, it is it's always been that way. Vaijyo Narayano Harihi is our principal. We believe that you guys are the incarnations of Lord Narayana on earth, which is basically a doc, a, doc, a, a god taking doctor's form across the world. And I also would like to take this opportunity to thank your family members who are letting you guys to go out there and take that risk and be out in the front uh, for, in the front lines of the danger and be there for the humanity. That's, that means a lot because it's not, does, it, takes, it takes the entire family to make that commitment, to, to be out there with everybody to say, yes, this matters. And we are willing to take the risk. Just like we were saying, if you have a healthcare worker, quarantine them. Don't be with them, even though they come back home. So it's a it's not an easy thing uh, for those families to go through. But I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of uh, the healthcare supply chain, everybody that is involved in the whole process, the one that touches the patient to somebody that supplies everything to them. I would like to thank, take this opportunity to thank all of you guys and thank for spreading this positive energy through uh, your advice today through this panel. Hopefully we'll do more of this in future and then bring doctors from other countries like in uh, Australia, Germany, uh, UK. You guys have network all across the world, bring them as well so we can have their views presented uh, through this panel if we can. And again, thank you very much as we uh, do this at the end of each B plus sessions that we do. You know, usually there are other people part of this panel, but now you can encourage your fellow coworkers that are across the world doing this. Let's all clap for them uh, and then pray for their safety. And then uh, hopefully that's all. Uh, that, that's what we can do, clap for you when we do prayers at night every day, uh, in the morning every day or every time we pray, we include you in our prayers, include your families in our prayers. Uh, let's go with the positive spirit that we're going to get through this. This too shall pass is what I believe and there is always light that is greater than the darkness. Uh, with, all, with that thought, I'm going to uh, conclude this session. Thanks again and uh, we'll be in touch. Uh, phenomenal. It was amazing to talk to you guys. It's been an honor. Thank you. Last, last, uh, Bhaskar Garu, I, yes. I want to ask uh, Shailaja, Dr. Shailaja, about what, what is it, uh, toll, num toll free number? Uh, uh, to, to I have the yeah. Texas uh, toll free number. Um, it's a 1 800 number. It's a, uh, every state has a mental health line. So for Texas, it's 1 833 986 1919. And it's okay. the National Mental Health Support Line. And a lot of my colleagues, psychologists and psychiatrists are offering free uh, service via phone and video or, or whatever they can. Yeah, we can actually guide, guide the people, people who Sarajan, follow yeah. to that number. Can I, can I suggest you to put it in the group, please, our Be Positive Doctors group before you quit the group? So that, uh, yes, uh, yes yeah. definitely. I'll so put all I, I also shared that number on, uh, on our YouTube live. Again, thank you very much for your time. Uh, go out there. Uh, okay, Bhaskar Garo. Yes. Okay, then. So I started a company called Passion Health Physicians. So, and in this, I am serving the parents coming to the United States who are visiting Texas and Georgia. So in this coronavirus pandemic, who are stuck here, not able to go back to their countries, I am trying to help them in refilling their medications. So 
a HIPAA compliant portal. Oh, great, sir. Say, share that as well. I'm going to put it on our uh, channel. Thank, Thank you very much. Have a good night, everyone. Uh, be safe, and we're all praying for you. Thank you. Great. Thank you.